thing that I've noticed is that information technology really proceeds in a very predictable manner, an exponential manner, doubling in power every year. And it does this no matter what the world environment is, through thick and thin, through war and peace, through boom times and recessions, even in the Great Depression, the, the progression of information technology continued. And ultimately, it's going to affect everything we care about, even our own health. And I'll be talking uh, about this some more. Uh, and actually, it is only these technologies that have the scale to solve the problems that we're concerned with, like disease, like the environment, like global warming and energy and so on. And I began to track technology trends because of my own interest in being an inventor. I realized very quickly that the key to being successful as an inventor was timing. Most inventors fail, not because they can't get their devices to work, but because the timing is wrong. Not all the technologies are in place when they need to be for their, t for their invention to be successful. So realizing this, I began to be an ardent student of technology trends. And I gathered data in many different fields. And I tried to make predictions about how technology would progress. And it turned out that if I could measure the underlying information properties of an industry or of a technology, uh, I could make very accurate predictions. It turned out that the information content of a technology follows very predictable, very remarkably smooth uh, trajectories. And those trajectories are exponential. They progress by doubling every year. Uh, the power of computers, but also biological technologies, even energy technologies like solar power, get twice as powerful every year. And exponential progress is really quite surprising. If I take 30 linear steps, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I get to 30. If I take 30 exponential steps, 2, 4, 8, 16, I get to a billion. And so there's really quite a big difference. Our intuition is linear. People, when they think about the future, think it's going to progress in this linear manner. The current pace of progress will continue at today's rate. But that's not the reality. The reality is that these technologies expand in an exponential manner. So what might seem impossible today turns out to be very feasible just a few years hence. When I was an undergraduate at the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MT, uh, in the Boston area 40 years ago. I came to MIT because it was so advanced in 1965, it actually had its own computer. Most colleges didn't have a computer. And it took up half a building, and all thousands of us students shared it. Today, the computer in your cell phone is a million times cheaper. It's a million times smaller. And it's a thousand times more powerful. That's a billion-fold increase in capability per unit of currency that we've actually seen in the last 40 years. And the speed of exponential growth is getting faster and faster. We'll actually do that again. As powerful and influential as information technology is today, we'll see another billion-fold increase in capability over the next 25 years. And this is about 100,000 times smaller than that computer at MIT, even though it's 1,000 times more powerful. And we'll see another 100,000-fold shrinking in the next 25 years. So it used to take up a building, now fits in my pocket. What now fits in my pocket will fit inside a blood cell in 25 years. And if I were to say 25 years from now, you'll have millions of blood cell-sized robots in your bloodstream, keeping you healthy from inside and going inside your brain and putting your brain on the Internet and making you smarter, you'd say that sounds pretty futuristic. But I point out there's already 50 experiments of doing exactly that with the first generation of these blood cell sized devices in animals. One scientist actually cured type 1 diabetes in rats with a blood cell sized device in the bloodstream. It releases insulin in a controlled fashion, blocks antibodies, and cures type 1 diabetes, and they're gearing up for human trials. At MIT, they have a blood cell sized device and that can detect cancer cells based on the chemicals on their surface. It detects them, it, it latches onto them, and then blocks them and destroys them. And these, so these are early experiments today. But if you take what we can do today and realize that these technologies will be a billion times more powerful in 25 years, you get some idea of what's feasible. You can put a computer inside your brain today if you're a Parkinson's patient. Uh, and it's not 
not blood cell size today. It's pea size. It's pretty small. You have to put it in by surgery. And this actually replaces the biological neurons destroyed by Parkinson's disease. And the latest generation of this approved mainstream neural implant allows you to download new software to the computer inside your brain from outside the patient. And again, if you look at what we can do today and realize that these will be 100,000 times smaller in 25 years and a billion times more powerful, you get some idea of what will be feasible. And this exponential growth, it's doubling in power every year of information technology, is not just computers. It affects everything we care about. It affects our own health. It affects energy, and I'll explain how that is the case. Take health and medicine. As of a few years ago, that was not an information technology. It was just hit or miss. We'd find things that happened to work. We'd look through many substances to try to find things that lower blood pressure or improve heart health. And uh, we didn't really understand how these uh, interventions worked. Drug development was called drug discovery, just trying to find something that worked. And we made progress. Human life expectancy was 37 in 1800, only 200 years ago. But health and medicine was not an information technology. A few things happened just in the last few years that have now made health and medicine an information technology. We collected the genome, the human genes. And these are actually little software programs that run inside our bodies. How long do you go without updating the software on your portable electronics? Probably not more than a few weeks. But we have this outdated software that runs in our bodies. We've now actually collected that. We have these software programs that run in our bodies. And that was actually a good example of exponential growth. Because when that project was announced in 1990, mainstream skeptics said, there's no way you're going to collect the whole human genome in 15 years. We just had our best students and our most advanced equipment and around the world. We collected one ten thousandth of the genome. This is going to take centuries. Halfway through the project, the skeptics were still going strong, saying, I told you this wasn't going to work. Here you are halfway through the project, and you've only finished 1% of the project. This is a failure. But that actually was right on schedule for an exponential progression. It had been doubling every year. And if you double 1% seven more times, you get 100%, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. And that's exactly what happened. And in addition to the genome, which was completed in 2003, we now have the means of actually changing our genes, not just in a baby, but in a, in a mature individual. A technique called RNA interference can turn off selected genes. So if we can identify a gene that advances aging or advances a disease, we can now actually turn that gene off. Uh, one gene we'd like to turn off, for example, is called the fat insulin receptor gene. That gene basically says, hold on to every calorie because the next hunting season may not work out so well. Remember, these genes evolved thousands of years ago when conditions were quite different. That was a good idea a thousand years ago. That underlies an epidemic of obesity today, particularly in my country. What would happen if we turned that gene off? That was actually tried in animals. It turned off the fat insulin receptor gene. These animals ate a lot, and they remained slim. And they didn't get diabetes. They didn't get heart disease. They lived 20% longer. They got the benefits of eating less while eating more. And there are several pharmaceutical companies rushing to bring that idea to the human market. And there's a lot of other